Half a day students, I am Governor Lou Leon Guerrero. You all have been through a year of big changes. We've had to adapt and make big changes to keep our families and our islands safe. But with change comes opportunity and a chance to try new things like PBS University. While Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenori and I will continue to do our part to keep our island safe, you students have a part to play as well. Your part is to keep learning and to keep up with your lessons. That's why I am happy to see you here ready to learn with PBS University. PBS University is a way to bring a continuous educational curriculum to you while you stay safe at home during this time. To help you keep up with your studies, we asked our friends at PBS Guam and the Guam Department of Education to put together this episode. Thank you for doing your part and have a great lesson. Humanities Guan, an independent nonprofit organization affiliated with the National Endowment for the Humanities, is dedicated to promoting public humanities programming for the people of Guam and providing foundational support and educational resources for our island community. For more information about Humanities Guan, visit www.humaniesguan.org. The following webinar series is part of a project presented by Humanities Guan entitled Unincorporated Voting Voices and Visions Pataguan. This project explores tomorrow stories, experiences, and perspectives on civic engagement in relation to voting rights, democracy, political status, and tomorrow self-determination. Unincorporated consisted of the five-part webinar series that took place from January through May 2021 and covered topics on the origins of Chamorro self-determination, the work of the Commission on Decolonization, the relationship between art and decolonization, and the role of the U.S. legal system as it relates to Guam's political status. The project culminated with the launch of an online and printed magazine distributed throughout the community, which consists of essays, creative reflections, and artwork exploring issues around Guahan's political status and decolonization colonization through the perspectives and historical and political experiences of the Chamorro people of Guahan. What I remembered was that he said, Pului Dogamu, Jan Holomgi Gi Holomi Lati. And I was like, wow, okay, well, we're outside. Why do we need to take off our Zori, right? He goes, this Lati said is from our ancestors and they still live within it. So you have to respect it. So every time I walk there or I go there with somebody, I was like, hey, if we want to walk within the Lati set, you got to take off your shoes or your Zori. That just stuck with me. But every time he would be down and out and he'd need his spirit rejuvenated, that's the spot that he went to was the Lati Park. And that's why we chose it as a family to be the place to be renamed for him. And that was one thing that stuck with me is just within the Latis and strength and getting to talk to people and getting them to know that their strength, our strength as a people, but not just you're not alone how can we do this together? What road are we going to take as a collaborative effort? And just knowing that we are this strong people, smart. Yeah, we're very, oh, my lahalem, we're very um, open to outsiders and we've got very great hospitality. But the main thing is know your roots. We're tomorrow first. Yeah, we can invite people in. But Celo, how are you going to be able to give them food if your sister's not right next to you, helping you in the kitchen? And you know what I mean? You're, so your roots is the strength. And if we don't realize that right now, that without each other, we can't move forward, then really, why am I going to talk to you? I'm going to go and talk to the, somebody that will want to have that conversation. But I mean, it's not even at that. We shouldn't stop there. But it's just realizing that within our roots and together as a people, we have that ability to do it. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. One thing that definitely stands out to me in the artwork, but also in what you're sharing is the importance of intergenerational memory of stories, because your piece brings together sort of the first Angel Santos and then another Angel Santos, right? And so it's meant to, but then it also sort of, you have the, the Lati, the foundation. And so I think it's something which is often forgot very easily nowadays, right? Is that 
when we feel rooted and lost, a lot of it just comes from the fact that the conversations between generations, they don't happen. They don't happen as much as they used to. In my mom's generation, your child was likely to be raised by the television. <laughs> and then now your child is likely to be raised by YouTube. <laughs> And so when we talk about what we're losing or what we're missing, a lot of it is those connections across generations, because every generation will struggle. And I remember your, your brother saying it too, that if you don't fix it this generation, the next generation will struggle with it. But we have to talk to the next generation about sort of what the struggles are so that they don't have to then encounter it brand new. Or feel like they're alone. Again, because for many activists, for example, or, or people in the community who who feel strongly about the rights of the Chamorro people or for political status change, there's always this feeling that, oh, that's not traditional, that's new. So when Robert Underwood and others in Patapada OPIR back in the day, you know, when they would speak out, people would criticize them and say that they're half-breeds. And so this only comes about because it's not rooted what they feel. It's because they have identity conflicts. Right. And they don't know who they are. So that's why they're challenging the system. They're speaking mm -hmm. out. But what you are reminding us about today with the story of, of your brother, but also me knowing your parents and knowing that they have stood up for justice in the past and they have talked about it and taught others about it, knowing that these struggles are not brand new, that people have been struggling and fighting over these issues of justice for a very long time. But different generations feel that they can say things, they can do things. And in truth, your brother and those with him paved the way so that those of us today can say a lot more comfortably than others could, right? I always say that Angel Santos and them, they used to, you know, sometimes you can get fired from your job for speaking out or you get kicked out of the family for speaking out. Nowadays, it's more comfortable. And so it's because those pioneers have sort of created the possibilities for us today. Sidus Masi Anj, because I think your piece is a, is a great reflection on the need for those, that contact between generations. And I love the carvings, the pieces that you've got there, because they're both are a call to action, but a call to build and to stabilize. I love it. So many metaphors. All right. And so remember, if you have any questions for Terry or for Ange, you can put them into the comments. And then after, we're going to get to our last panelist, but then we're also going to come back together with everybody at the end. And so our last panelist, Dr. Isa Ariola, Buena Safade. Dr. Isa Ariola is a sociocultural anthropologist who was born and raised in Saipan. She earned her doctorate from the University of California at Los Angeles. Isa employs an interdisciplinary approach to understanding how processes of militarization transform the sociopolitical realities of indigenous peoples and environments in the contemporary Marianas. I don't think I've had the pleasure of meeting you in person. Isa, I know that we've emailed, we've talked on the phone, and now we have Zoomed. So I think we have the remote communication fiesta going on. But I look forward to one day meeting you in person. Your piece in this essay, which you're going to talk about, it is so timely, and it makes such an important point. And going to what Ange was saying earlier about the need that we are stronger together, we can say that in Guam, but we should also say that across the Marianas. We should also say that across Micronesia. And so, Sidus Masi Padifinatomo. Sidus Masi, thank you so much, Dr. Mike, for that introduction and for allowing me to be part of this conversation. You know, I have to say it's such a great honor to be thinking alongside all of these other inspiring people that are included, not only on this panel, but the other contributors in the magazine. And I'm just so inspired by all of the flourishing work that's happening on self-determination and on this topic of being unincorporated, which is a word that has just troubled me for so long. And so I'm so happy to see it as the title of the magazine. But all of this really is to say that it, it brings such a steady flow of hope to our respective communities. And I'm, I'm very grateful. So thank you for allowing me to be here and to Humanity Guahan. So today I'll just be touching really briefly on my reflection essay, and this reflection essay is entitled The Reunification of the Marianas. And so the questions I was thinking th through, and if you'll just allow me to kind of talk through it, I know the guests here today haven't had the chance to read through it, but just kind of taking you through my thought process here. I started to think about, okay, what was the original goal of reunification? How has reunification changed over time? 
over space? You know, what does it mean for the different islands? And most importantly, I think to me, was how do we experience reunification and understand reunification in our everyday lives today in our contemporary world? And so when I was first writing this piece, I started to do some preliminary research and just like what has been written about reunification and thinking through some of the stories I heard about reunification growing up. And so there's this kind of narrative, right, that there was this vote to reunify in the 60s with Saipan voting yes, Guahan voting no. So reunification never kind of came to fruition, but there's lots of hard feelings there perhaps it's been postulated stemming from the war and all of these different kinds of stories. And, and the people here who are joining us today perhaps have their own stories and what they've heard growing up. And often this narrative touches on reunification as a way, or at least the way reunification was understood back then, perhaps was to promote statehood for the entire Marianas and therefore a supposedly stronger relationship with the United States and a pull away from a more pan-Micronesian identity that was seen as, I guess, less lucrative economically. But for this reflection, it was less about writing this history, right, and about like this, this definitive history of reunification than it was about truly, again, reflecting on what it means for us now in this particular moment. And, and by this moment, what I mean is the moment that we find ourselves in in this unincorporated space collectively. Yes, Guahan's a colony. We're a commonwealth, but collectively we're unincorporated, right? And in particular, this moment, the important aspect that I wanted to bring to this essay was in the midst of this hyper-militarization of our islands, of our oceans, of our skies that we're now so familiar with, in the midst of this U.S.-China competition and aggression and maritime power that we're seeing. And I talk about this moment because I hope, rather than looking at it as like a kind of fearful place. I, I want to use it to inspire political creativity. I really feel like our political creativity has been so stifled. And, and so instead of having this choked conversation that's so tied to political status and so tied to increasing national power or United States power, just having a more localized and creative conversation, right? And so to give a sense of my direction and some of the things that came to mind when I was asked to write about reunification, the first thing I wanted to do was situate myself and explain, okay, I was born and raised on Saipan. So I bring a CNMI perspective to the table. And it's, of course, it's one of the many perspectives in this collective conversation, but it's important to highlight the difference, obviously, in, in the way that you experience reunification or the possibility of reunification, depending on where you're situated within the Marianas. And I know there's a lot of fear. I've spoken to some folks in our community a few years ago about reunification, there's always this question of fear, you know, who will we be? Will we be subsumed by Guahan, you know, this scary tone to it? And perhaps that's something we can discuss later. I'd love to hear what other people think. But there's no mistake, of course, that the historical separation between the Sinamai and Guahan since the Spanish-American War, there's no question that it's produced a kind of violence. And so this long-standing violence that really, really artificially separates our people. And I say violence because of the way that it disrupted cultural continuity, change, political life. And again, what I had just mentioned, importantly, the way it disrupted our political possibilities, our political imagination, that were always already subsumed by U.S. interests, by the U.S. political imaginary. And so another approach I took to this essay was there's this level of interest that I have on the ground here on Saipan is just like an everyday citizen, you know, it's always important to not just explore these concepts and these political concerns. And I think that's why this magazine is so amazing, but from the kind of vantage point of experts, but from the perspective of the everyday. And so how are people engaging with reunification at home, you know, with their friends, with their family? Why are we continually invoking the term now as we have in the past, but what is bringing it up again? Why are we talking about it, et cetera? And at the same time, we can still remain very attuned and aware of the conversations that are kind of happening over our heads about reunification or have happened about reunification, like in Washington, for example, like what becoming a state or becoming independent would do for voting power, for example. But the important question here, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at is, are we prioritizing our needs as Indigenous peoples and our longevity as Indigenous peoples in this conversation? And then if we are, 
then how do we negotiate our priorities without homogenizing or erasing the differences that have come about with our respective communities? As we know, nation building is a very violent, can be a very violent thing. We experience this firsthand. So what does that mean for us as we build a kind of unified future? And so in the essay, I include Teresia Teawa's beautiful poem called Amnesia. And I really love this poem because she writes about our islands as these kind of stepping stones between America and Asia and what happens in that process of being in the in-between. And there's this forgetting There's this erasure of us. And I really like thinking through these issues, all of these issues that we're talking about through her poem, because it reminds us that, you know, we aren't, and we know this, but it's a reminder that we aren't just stepping stones to someone else's politics or just to, again, to the U.S. political family. It's not just that. And so it's this push to take ownership of, of our own sovereignty, of our own political life and stop, at least from the CNMI perspective to stop understanding sovereignty as this thing that we like gave up for citizenship. And if we can't do that, if we're not prioritizing an indigenous sovereignty, then I don't believe that we're moving in the right direction. So again, thinking back to really what are the goals guiding reunification? And I end my essay with a focus on the land. And of course, by land, I'm not just talking about like the physical land that we're standing on and talking about our our epistemology, the way we understand and land in a more holistic sense, you know, as ancestral, as connected to the sea, to the air. And and this is coming at a time where on Saipan right now, this is particularly important to continue to keep our eyes focused on the land and and our senses and our hearing and and everything because of the, the recent legislative initiative, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but SLI 22-01, which is seeking to amend Article 12. And if you aren't already familiar, Article 12 allows those of uh, Northern Marianas descent to maintain ownership over the buying, selling and leasing of land in the CNMI. And so a lot of people have come out in our community to really stress the importance of what this has meant for our people and what, what it continues to mean for our people. And so why am I talking about this? Okay. So, you know, this is important because I think any discussion of our political future, reunification, anything has to be based on this preservation of the land which is intimately connected to indigenous sovereignty rights. So like, we know these things, right? Without a focus on the land, we can't even have a discussion about our identity, our language, any of that without the land. So I'll kind of try to draw to an end here. But one of the most important things that I've learned from so much of the kind of demilitarization advocacy work that's happening across the archipelago is that what harms one island harms the whole even though there's this kind of appearance of segmentation because of this political history and even the way that the military kind of segments us, right? It's very deceiving. We're always experiencing the effects of militarism and and political status together. And so my final thought on the question of how I envision a unified Marianas is that I see it already happening and, and it's not necessarily so obsessed and so connected to this idea of political status, you know, and to me, that's so beautiful. That's like a very decolonial way and a very Chamorro way and Northern Marianas descent way of viewing these issues. In fact, I end my piece by saying in many ways of reunification has already begun. And again, precisely because we're always confronting the limits of this uneven political status question every day. And so I think I'll end there and and I'd love to hear more from, and also I just wanna say thank you to the two other panelists. I mean, the poem, the art, it's so inspiring and it all just fits together perfectly with all of these topics. So, so thank you so much. For bringing that very critical perspective into this discussion. It is interesting how our, our islands politically It's as if your brother lives next door, but because you live in separate houses, you can't help each other. That sometimes simply because there is a wall between you, you forget that the wall can separate you as much as you would like to be separated. And so thank you for reminding us about that perspective. So I know we are coming to the Q&A section now. We have a few questions that have come in. This one is for potentially all of you, and I think it's an important one because going to what Isa had mentioned about how reunification is already happening, a lot of it is happening through the creative arts or cultural arts, even if politically it's not anywhere near yet. We have a question from Monyeka de Oro, again, and here she asks, Afade Monyeka, Sidus Masi, what role does art play in the decolonization movement? 
how should the community best support artists creating social movement and conscious art? And so definitely, however we decide to define decolonization in terms of a, a status change. And in the magazine, there's lots of perspectives on what decolonization could be. There are those who feel that it would mean full inclusion in the United States. There's some who feel that it means we unify with the Marianas or that we integrate further with Micronesia. And then there's some who feel that it, it would be becoming independent. And so what are your thoughts on this? What role can art play in sort of these movements for real fundamental political change? No, I, I talked to my answer. Okay, I'll, I'll read your answer, Hungan. So yes. Angela says, I believe that art should show the movement in a way of independence thinking, sparking that wonder or curiosity in those who may not have seen it that way before. I think it's a catalyst in thinking outside the box to be able to create a story in many different views. That's very true, right? Because if you've ever tried to, to talk to somebody about some of these issues directly about it, they may resist, they may shut down. But if you can come at it in a more creative way, then they may be more open to it, right? And so, Sidus Masi and Terry or Isa, did you have some thoughts on the role of art? I think art. For me, obviously, I can't define it for everybody, but I think art, when it's at its finest, is an organic expression, right? That I don't know where it comes from. Everybody says it comes from muses or the gods or our Sina or wherever it comes from. So I think that role needs to be respected in any kind of movement. It isn't always, but I think in terms of artists creating social movement, conscious art, I'm not sure, Manyaka, sweetie, how you're defining that, but I think I know. But I feel that all, <laughs> this is a contentious area because there's a lot of art that sucks, that is part of, so they're part of social movements that I don't align with. And so then I need to question how I feel about this, right? And I, and I think we all kind of know what this means. So that's not an easy question. Should the community support all kinds of art? How should they support it? So the first question is, should they support it? Yes. How should they support it? That I don't know. Other than in terms of what Humanities Guahan is doing, not everybody can get an Andrew Mellon grant. Right. So that's an issue. But DIY zines and, and things like that are very much self-driven. But in terms of the community, I don't know. I That's that's the eternal question, Manyaka. Totally. I have no clue. But somebody else might have a better answer. <laughs> uh, Isa, do you have uh, something to add? or? Yeah, so I like to think of myself as an artist. I'm not an artist like the other panelists are but no I when I think of art you know this is this might seem kind of random but I feel like when you write about militarism so much and you think about militarism so much it's exhausting and I think everyone can like attest to that and living in this unincorporated space as we know it's just exhausting sometimes and so for me sometimes just trying to literally sketch out or draw out what it feels like or or just to like express that sense of exhaustion that's been a really like cathartic thing and something that I find myself turning to more and more and so yeah it just gives you that space and so it's nothing deep just my my kind of thoughts on that nice it's just massy. and so we have another question focusing on cultural connections in the Marianas and reunification and so in what ways do we see, because you say you mentioned sort of that we see reunification happening in certain ways. And so somebody is asking me, focusing on the fact that the Marianas and Guam, Northern Marianas and Guam have different spelling systems, sort of is there, is there really reunification happening? <laughs> I know that's the, it's one of my language students who went there. But so how do we see this, though, for people who sort of may not perceive it? In what ways do we see the, these connections happening? And Issa, if you want to start, but uh, Andrew, Terry, you can also join it. Yeah, I would love to hear what the other panelists think. So I don't know. because Yes, that's the kind of message I hear around me all the time. I have to say, you know, to be honest, I have a kind of positive spin on this, right? But I hear that kind of stuff all the time. But I always think about, okay this difference is not disunity. It's just difference. And I think that's what's so beautiful about the way we're moving to whatever it is, whatever kind of reunification we're hoping to achieve is to not lose that difference, to just like showcase the difference and like dive headfirst in that difference and, and not be
These webinars can be accessed on Humanities Guahan's Facebook page. To view the online magazine associated with Unincorporated Voting Voices and Visions Paraguahan, visit humanitiesguahan.org backslash unincorporated. Half a day students, I'm Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio. For more than a year now, you all have continued to wash your hands and watch your distance from others. And you've done a really great job wearing your masks. We know your parents and guardians have helped you to make these changes to keep yourself and your community safe. As Governor Leon Guerrero said, we are happy you are here. We want you to continue to learn and sharpen your skills with the help of PBS University. This program is the result of a collaborative effort. We couldn't do it alone. I'd like to thank the teachers and support staff of the Guam Department of Education and PBS Guam for their work and their commitment to our students. I'd also like to thank you students for participating at home. To your parents, I'd like to thank you for taking an active role in your child's education. We are all eager to return to a time when all of us can share and study together in person. Until then, we hope you learned something new from this PBS University instruction.